to my knowledge, there is no drug, nor is there any form of exercise, conventional forms of exercise, that increase the catecholamines to that level for that long. When you're suffering or you're lazy or you're procrastinating, doing something that's harder than the state that you're in bounces you back yes. much faster. There's a reason there's an ADHD drug shortage right now. Ritalin, Adderall, they all tap into this system, the dopaminergic and adrenaline norepinephrine system. Mm. So one of the most prescribed and over-prescribed classes of drugs is a drug designed to try and get exactly this effect of cold plunges. Yeah. This is all based in the dynamics of dopamine. It, it's sort of crazy. If, you know how people are procrastinating to write something or just, and they start cleaning the house? Yeah. Something they normally don't want to do. Well, it's just something that's easier than the thing that you're supposed to do. Right. If you do something that's even harder than the thing that you're trying to avoid, all of a sudden you're able to do that. Once dopamine is deployed at that level, you're a different person. And I know this because if you take someone's dopamine and lower it, that makes them depressed. If you lower it even more and give them movement disorder, Parkinson's, if you give them their dopamine back, their focus increases. And so I completely agree. If people would just take a very cold shower or a very cold plunge or a little bit longer at 50 degrees, but although I agree with you that shorter, colder is better, I do that daily. But then on Tuesdays is the typical day where I do very, very hot and very, very cold back and forth for well over an hour back and forth. Back yeah, and you forth. do that, that growth hormone increasing yeah. protocol. Yeah. I'm trying to condition myself to really be able to tolerate heat and cold. And so to me, it's always interesting that it, you have to look what's happening during and you have to look at what's happening afterward. And I, for some reason, as humans, we like these creature comforts of massages, which are great. Um, you know, the sauna, which is great. Although if you crank it up really hot, it's work at some level. It's always work at the end. It, there's that the moment. last five minutes of a 25 minute session at 190 yeah. degrees. Those are, that's work. Yeah. And there's something about the, the burning in the nose for me, mm. at least my heart rate starts like, I want to get the hell out burning of in the nose. So are you using water on the rocks a lot? Yeah. So that's, what's giving yeah. you the burning in the nose. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm, you know, it's always hard to know how hot it is right at the place where it reaches your body. Mm -hmm. I've been cranking it way, way up. Like what temperature? Like 260. What? 260. But I 260. Cover, but I cover my head. <laughs> why? So that, what are you, a brisket? No. What the f are you doing? Well, so that, <laughs> well what I've found why? is... Well, why are you doing that? I'll, I'll, so what's interesting is your desire to get out of the, of the hot tub or the, the too hot hot tub is because of burning on the skin, right? But right. your desire to get out of the sauna is usually a brain thing. And you'll notice this because if you go to a Russian banya, they all wear uh -huh. the little wool hats. Yeah. That's to insulate their brain against the heat so they can stay in at hotter temperatures on their body. So I'm in at 260, but I've got my head covered with a wool cap. So it doesn't feel as stressful. But I'm doing it because I like to, I like to but sweat. if it doesn't feel as stressful, wouldn't it have less of a positive effect? Okay, so um, this is great because what you're starting to do is tease out the variables. So this yeah. is where I think it gets interesting. You can get better at sweating. I know fighters do this in preparation, you know, dropping weight. You can get better by doing more sauna. You get it to be a better sweater, which means that you can drop, you can cool more easily, even in clothes or if you're out running or hunting or doing anything. So there's some advantage to being a better at sweating. And sweating itself is a whole interesting story. You actually have nerves that control the sweat glands. That's actually controlled by, by little nerve endings. And those pathways can grow very, very quickly in the presence of heat. So what I've been trying to do is learn how to dump heat better. And mm. if I don't use the, you know, the hat, what happened was I was getting up to 220 and I'd sit in there for like 45 minutes. I'm thinking this is not doing anything for me anymore. I want to increase my sweating. Man. I'm contrasting this with cold. Yeah. And so well, that's a difference. Are you yeah. going cold and then 260? I'm a wimp. I, I start in the cold for a minute. Then I go into the sauna, then back into the cold for two minutes, back into the sauna, then three but minutes. But you're not a wimp. Why are you saying that? Well, listen, if I were tougher, I'd go five minutes in the cold straight off. Yeah. But I just had Susanna Soberg out to, uh, for a podcast. Um, and she taught me some really interesting things. What she showed was that if people get 11 minutes of deliberate cold exposure per week total, and this is divided up into sessions of one to three minutes or four minutes even. So it's not 11 minutes all at once. They fundamentally change the amount of brown fat that they have, which means they fundamentally change the number of mitochondria in the brown fat, which means they fundamentally change their thermogenic properties of their body, and increase their metabolism. Now, the, the people who don't like cold say, well, the increase in metabolism wasn't enough to offset more than a few bites of a bagel or something. But that's not the point, really. What she also showed was that this increase in thermogenesis allowed people to be more comfortable in cold environments, even when they're not in the cold. And then people say, well, who cares, right? I'll throw in a, a jacket. Ah, but what she 
was able to show is that the ability to be comfortable in the cold correlates with a bunch of other important immune functions and metabolic functions and insulin sensitivity, which is a good thing. And the inability to do that is likely to not be healthy for us. And she also showed that 57 minutes per week is the threshold for sauna. So if people get 57 minutes per week of uncomfortably warm but safe sauna exposure, they can get very similar effects. And, it, and then that gave rise to this question I always said, do you end with cold or do you end with heat? And she said, end with cold because then your body's forced to warm itself back up. Mm. And that's what's now called the Soberg principle, which is when you end with cold, your body has to use its natural machinery to heat back up. In talking to her recently, I learned some really interesting things that I've been incorporating. First of all, I've always avoided putting my head under until the very end in the cold. Turns out that if you put your face in the water right as you go in, you activate the mammalian dive reflex. And this reflex increases the so-called parasympathetic activity of the autonomic nervous system, which is just nerd speak for it lowers your heart rate, it makes you calmer, and it makes you better able to tolerate stress. So try this next time. Go. You could even just put your face in before. I go right under. You go right under. Yeah. So that's the I right way to do it. I plug my nose. I go right under. So I didn't know this. A lot of people that do deliberate cold get headaches. They don't feel good. And a lot of times it's because they slowly immerse themselves up to the neck. And then right at that interface of cold and hot, it, it creates change, vasoconstriction right below, a little bit vasodilation above. They get headaches. They don't feel good. The heart rate is way too high. Putting your face under Isn't really that anxiety, helps. though? I, I just feel like that's all psychological. I really do. Because there's, there's a moment when you get in the cold where there's a part of your brain that goes, let's get out of here. You can get out of this if you will just get out right now. And you got to go shut the fuck up. But if you don't say shut the fuck up, then that thing runs rampant through your brain. And that kicks your heart rate up and that kicks your anxiety up. I really think it's psychological. Well, it's psychological and it's physiological. So here's right, physiological yeah. because of psychological. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. So here's what we know for sure. For the first 20 to 30 seconds of cold shock when you get in, mm -hmm. which is how it's described, that prefrontal cortex that normally is has the job of handling context and says shh to the reflexes of the brain and the impulses of the brain is not active for 20 to 30 seconds. So your reflex to get the hell out of there mm. is very, there's a clear and logical reason for that. After that 20 or 30 seconds, the forebrain starts coming online again. That's your opportunity to start negotiating with yourself of, oh, this is actually good for me. This, this is, I can handle this. I got through that so I can get through the next one. What I've been doing recently is trying to not go for time, but going for the only way I can describe this would be walls. Like sometimes just getting in the thing is a wall for me. So I go, okay, I got over one wall just getting in the damn thing. Then I'm like, oh God, here it comes. Four brains shutting down. I'm like panicking. I'm going to get through this. And then I'm watching for when I have the impulse to get out. And what I start to notice is that the, the gaps between those walls start getting longer and longer.